This is Black Agenda Radio, a weekly hour of African American political thought and action. Welcome to the radio magazine that brings you news, commentary, and analysis from a black left perspective. I'm Margaret Kimberly, along with my co-host Glenn Ford. Coming up, we hear a lot of discussion these days about the history of genocide against black Americans. But many people are still unaware that black leftists presented a petition to the United Nations charging the U.S. with genocide 70 years ago. And... Patrice Lumumba, the first elected prime minister of the Congo, was assassinated 60 years ago with the collaboration of the United States. A group of scholars marked the occasion with a discussion of Lumumba's political legacy. But first, it's been one hell of a year, politically and on the public health arena. The Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations held a national conference last week to sum up the changes and challenges that emerged in 2020. Black is Back is a coalition of organizations. Betty Davis is a New York City activist who chairs the coalition's Community Control of Education Working Group. She says black folks need to seize control of their local education budget. The federal budget that comes down to New York City is the 23rd largest budget in the world. There are cities across this country that have a federal budget for education that is larger than many third world countries, but you don't control that money. And once again, that's why you are not having the same services as your white counterparts. The education working group is simply saying, you can join us by listening to the election campaign school, run for the community board, run for the city council and get on the education committee. And by all means, we want you to understand that when they talk about defunding the police, they're only gonna put the money back because now that marijuana is not uh, a crime, the police are saying, give us more money because more people are taking pot and now we've got to control them. So the money is just gonna come back another way. You are not just talking about defunding the police, overturn the Patriot Act. You don't know this if you're not in school and you don't know the history of the Patriot Act. This country is too complex for you to do it by yourself. That is why you need the Black is Back Coalition. This is your obligation. If you want to be a bad slave, control your education and learn how. I think it was one of our warriors that said, The work of slavery is not done until it is self-perpetuating. Henry Highland said that. And he said, let resistance be your motto. This is one of the ways you can do that. So I hope you will join the Education Working Group by sending and connecting on the Black is Back Coalition website. We do not have funds and we are not asking you for funds. Your funds are already there. The majority of the European American people in this country control their public schools and their children are in public schools. Many of the charter schools, if not most, have Africans in them. And as I told you, cats don't educate mice. Even if you have a community-based charter school, you owe it to the other 80% of the African children who are not in a charter school to fight for that charter school. Go to the PTA meetings. As a citizen who pays any kind of taxes, you have the right to go there. Go to the community board meetings for education and ask them how they are spending your money. And whatever you do, if you get reparations to the Democratic Party, tell them you don't want them because that money will not come down to you. The Democratic Party is not your friend. Thank you. That was Betty Davis of the Black is Back Coalition's Community Control of Education Working Group. Ajamu Baraka is a veteran activist who ran for vice president on the Green Party ticket in 2016. He's national organizer for the Black Alliance for Peace, which is part of the Black is Back Coalition. Baraka told the coalition's year-end conference 
that U.S. imperialism was clearly in disarray in 2020. You know, this pandemic really pulled the ideological curtain from the system and exposed the reality of this backward racist system, a system that's characterized by greed, exploitation, degradation, social insecurity, corruption, and the normalization of coercive state violence. As a result of this and the ongoing capitalist crisis, the U.S. settler colonial state and system is facing its most serious crisis of legitimacy since the collapse of the capitalist economy during the years referred to as the so-called Great Depression. And we remember that this economic collapse comes on the heels of the deep crisis of the economy that occurred in 2007 and 2008, a crisis we might understand the African working class never recovered from. So this crisis and ongoing structural crisis that we are facing, we believe has centered the use of force as a permanent strategy for maintaining the hegemony of the capitalist ruling class uh, in this country and really uh, globally. And when we talk about colonial capitalist system, we're talking about a system that includes the European colonial process and their global domination that emerged when they first spilled out of Europe in 1492. So this dependency we saw that the state was going to be dependent on, this dependency on violence and coercion, was the motivating force for launching the Black Alliance of Peace. We are relatively new formation. We launched in April of 2017. We use the symbolic date of the state's assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King to help to bring a focus on what our concern was, which was basically to help to try to revive what we saw as the absolute necessity to bring back into the conversation this connection between domestic repression and the global domination of the colonial capitalist system and helping our people to understand the global nature of what we are up against and to help them to understand too the full range of how the state uses force and violence to maintain its hegemony in the U.S. That you can't understand and deal with the state in the U.S., in Detroit, if you don't understand what the same state is involved in uh, globally. So we launched in 2017 the thrust of our programmatic work we call the uh, No Compromise, No Retreat, Defeat the War Against African People in the U.S. and Abroad. Uh, it is a key programmatic work of the Alliance. Uh, the campaign represents, as we see it, a broad strategic and tactical framework. It responds to the changing dynamics of the moment while providing a common collective direction for one peace. When we talk about peace, we're not talking about some, some peacenik BS. We're talking about the African approach to the peace concept, the peace idea that primarily developed right after the end of the Second Imperialist War by people like Du Bois and others. And they paid a heavy price because they connected up the whole notion of peace with it not being able to be realized unless you destroy colonialism and the capitalist system. So we embrace that radical concept of peace. Another concept we embrace is the people-centered human rights framework which is the Black radical human rights tradition. And thirdly, our anti-imperialist focus, the work of our groups on the ground that are involved in educational and organizing work of the Alliance. We are engaged in this work. We see that there's a war being waged against our people. And we understood that this work that we were trying to develop, we could not develop this work without reaching out to other forces in this country that had a similar kind of perspective and indeed was providing leadership to this process. So a natural connection that we felt compelled that had to be made was for us to link up with the Black is Back Coalition. And that is exactly what we did. You know, the capitalists, you know, they, they have all these interlocking directorships and all of this to concentrate their power. And as revolutionaries, we got to be about doing the same kind of stuff. So it was a natural connection that we made in linking up our forces with the Black is Back Coalition. 
In general, we have been working on elements and, su- and topics very, very similar to m- most of what we see reflected in the Black is Back platform. But specifically, we looked at and worked on a few of the elements I raise up for a moment. Number one of the platform, the demand for the unconditional withdrawal of U.S. troops from the so-called Middle East, something we worked on and we expanded that idea of immediate withdrawal from all territories that the U.S. was occupying. We embrace number two that broadly deals with the issue of Israel, the Zionist settler state, and we connected up our concerns or the coalition's concern with withdrawing support for the Zionist state with some specifics in terms of activities of that Zionist state, like the training of U.S. police forces. We embrace of course, uh, number 10, that deals with the issues of our Black political prisoners. We expanded our work to include support for Black August. This last year, we, we uh, developed a month-long video series to highlight the still in prison political prisoners and prisoners of war. We embrace number, number 11, the right to health care. Of course, this is part of the broader human right to health Uh, Number 15, the elimination of the Northern Command, uh, which is basically an occupation force. People have to understand that the arrogance of this U.S. imperialist state, they have divided up the entire planet in these command structures. Uh, And the territory known as the U.S., where we are located, uh, has a command structure, the Northern Command. We embrace that. We also raise that focus about looking at all of the various command structures that exist across the planet, specifically the Indo-Pacific Command, but more specifically, AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command, which is reflective of item number 16 in the Black is Back uh, platform. That was, in general, what we did. This year, we continued with the work, the exceptional work and the the, uh, exceptional contribution that the coalition makes in conducting every year this electoral school. And last year was really important because of the elections that were being organized at that time. Uh, And we embraced that work. We participated, of course, in that. We did that because we agree with the orientation that, that understands that the electoral arena provides some strategic opportunities for us as we organize our people. Not and as an end in itself, but as a area of contestation with the state, a way in which we connect up with the masses of our people to organize and educate our people. So the theme of the school was imperialism is the context. Well, that's the theme that I raised in my presentation. Building power to win is the approach to bourgeois electoralism. That is the theme that we embrace, that basically you build power as part of the engagement with this bourgeois electoral process. So part of this electoral process that we embrace for the Black Alliance for Peace is the candidate accountability campaign. Uh, And this is where we raise up various issues connected to the platform, connected to our concerns. And we expanded that. And some of the issues we raised, we said that any candidate that comes to our people asking for support has to embrace certain minimal positions. Those positions, as we touched on a few of those already, in the Department of Defense 1033 program, that program responsible for militarizing the police forces across this country, uh, stop the uh, Israeli training of U.S. police forces, uh, move toward closure of the U.S. Africa Command. You have to advocate, advocate the closure of the 800 forward bases that the imperialist system has globally, oppose Trump's Operation Relentless Pursuit, oppose all military economic sanctions being imposed by people, by the state against people and nations around the planet. Demand an end to U.S. participation in the white supremacist NATO structure. Cut the military budget by 50 percent. Call on the U.S. Congress to pass legislation to support the global abolition of nuclear weapons. This is what we have, have been doing. This is what we will continue to do. In closing, we are facing a critical moment, folks, as we all know, the, the system is in desperate straits, and it, because of that, is even more dangerous than it has been before in the past. We are addressing the misleadership class 
of our people in this country and on the African continent. When we talk about closing Africa, we understand that means we've got to directly deal with the neocolonial puppets in power on the African continent. Things are going to get worse before they get better. And we have to demand more for us from ourselves as a consequence of that. So my friends, we have work to do. We cannot allow ourselves to be demoralized by any of the setbacks we might experience. We remind ourselves that we are on the side of our people and history, and that if we keep the focus on where we need to go to transform ourselves and transform the conditions of our people in this country and globally, understanding who we are as African people, now, there's no doubt in my mind, and hopefully in your minds also too, that we, in fact, will win. Uhuru, Black is back. That was Ajamu Baraka of the Black Alliance for Peace, speaking at the year-end conference of the Black is Back Coalition. In 1951, Black entertainer and activist Paul Robeson and other Black leftists presented a petition to the United Nations demanding that the United States be held accountable for a long list of crimes against its black population. The petition was titled, We Charge Genocide. Last week, Dr. Sharice burden Stelly joined other black activists and academics to commemorate the events of 70 years ago in an online seminar. Dr. burden Stelly is a professor of Africana Studies and Political Science at Carleton College, and part of the team that produces BAR's Black Agenda Review. She reminds us that U.S. government atrocities against Black people have never stopped. I think it's very fitting we're giving our comments on the anniversary of the assassination of, of Chairman Fred Hampton and Mark Clark by the Chicago Police Department. They were assassinated, obviously, for their political views, which were very much, I would say, consonant with what is ensconced in We Charge Genocide. I think this is a great occasion to think about the bankruptcy and injustice of the United States, which the We Charge Genocide position indicted. Of course, it was also around this time of year, December 17th to be exact, that the position was delivered to the UN General Council, as well as the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, and the UN Secretariat in NYC, um, December 17th, 1951. And so I will just briefly speak about the political, ethical, and epistemological dimensions of We Charge Genocide, because it's very important to think about how do we struggle for power and resources, what are the values that shape these struggles, and how do we come to know and make claims about what it is we ought to struggle for. So that is what I mean by politics, ethics, and epistemology. I had some background information about the petition, but in the interest of time, I'll just briefly gloss over that the petition compiled a mountain of evidence documenting more than 150 cases of murder or state executions and more than 350 instances of beating, maiming, rape, or threats only between the year of 1945 and 1951. And this, of course, was only a fraction of those actual occurrences. It also included appendices uh, that documented how state officials work with the KKK to disenfranchise Black people, the use of the charge of rape to politically and economically oppress Black people, the ways in which the monopoly control of the South made Southern people poorer than those in any other region of the nation, and also the refusal of Congress to enforce equal protection and therefore participating in the genocide of Black people. Briefly, the context in which the petition was drafted and circulated was the post-World War II demobilization and recession that coincided with the rise of anti-Black violence. This was when the Korean War was setting in. And there was also a fear of creeping fascism in the United States. And the increase in violence against Black people portended this creeping fascism. And of course, these conditions very much resonate with what's happening today. So I'll now turn to the politics of We Charge Genocide. And I'm going to read just a small segment from The Man Who Cried Genocide, which is William Patterson's autobiography. He wrote, quote, we in the CRC decided that the presentation of a petition charging the crime of genocide and thoroughly documenting what we regarded as the genocidal attitude of the U.S. government toward its Negro citizens was timely. It would be helpful, we thought, to all peoples fighting for freedom and would be particularly helpful here at home among both Black and white citizens where the role of the U.N. was not too well understood or appreciated. It would also point out to Black men and women the broadening avenues through which their struggle might move forward. 
And so here we see the politics of the petition are internationalist in scope. They are geared towards consciousness raising among Black people and oppressed people, that there's a linked fate between what's happening to Black people in the U.S. and what is going to happen as a result of U.S. imperialism to other racialized and oppressed folks subjected to imperialism. It is geared towards Black liberation and the liberation of all oppressed people, and is deeply anti-imperialist. And so this indictment is an indictment of U.S. imperialism, warmongering, and the sort of racial logics that animate that. Patterson went on to say, quote, the petition, I thought, should expose the reactionary role that the racists of the United States were preparing to play in world affairs, especially as dangerous to world peace. No government bound up with racism could want or seek world peace. And so here we see that the peace politics of the document are fundamentally bound up with the anti-racist politics. And contrary to the current liberal anti-racism that's circulating today, this was an anti-racism that was fundamentally predicated on the eradication of imperialism, colonialism, neo-colonialism, anti-Blackness, and also the anti-communism that was reinscribing white supremacy. And so this is an anti-racism that's a broader project of human flourishing and not just about behaviors or attitudes. In terms of ethics, ethics refers to well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do, usually in terms of rights, obligations, benefits to society, fairness, or specific virtues, um, as well as the study and development of one's ethical standards. And so we charge genocide as an ethical document reveals that racial capitalism is deeply unethical and immoral and that the conditions of Black people in the United States and the conditions of uh, oppressed people subjected to U.S. imperialism reveal the sort of moral bankruptcy of the United States. So a quote from We Charge Genocide is, quote, the genocide of which we complain is as much a fact as gravity. The whole world knows it. The proof is in everyday newspapers, in everyone's sight, and in hearing in these United States. Yet the conscience of mankind cannot be beguiled from its duty by the pious phrases and the daily legal euphemisms with which its perpetrators seek to transform their guilt into high moral purpose. So here we can see that the petition is indicting the moral bankruptcy of the United States that's used to legitimate the structural material abjection of Black people, and it's offering a new sort of ethical orientation. And this is manifested in the fact that the petition was a collective, mass-based, people-oriented document. So this was not a sort of great man tone produced by one person, but it was collectively worked on, edited, and researched. And it also focused on atrocity against women, children, as well as men. And it was deeply focused on the working class and poor Black folks. Previous petitions of this type tended to emphasize that the particular crimes committed against respectable Negroes or the Black petty bourgeoisie, but this document focused on the sort of attacks on a ravaging of Black workers and poor people. And so that is a sort of a collective anti-capitalist ethics in my perspective. It's also a courageous document. And courage is a very important ethic, I think. And as uh, Dr. Patterson spoke about, those who prepared and circulated the petition paid dearly for that, but it was worth it because it was meant to sort of draw connections of reciprocal care and concern, both nationally and internationally. Finally, in terms of epistemology, this can be understood as a study of how we come to know, understand, justify beliefs, and ascribe meaning to phenomena. And it's also concerned with the creation and dissemination of knowledge and, and the source of knowledge, as well as how knowledge is constituted. And so the philosopher Charles Mills talks about alternative epistemology that challenges pseudo-universalism, pseudo-universalisms and comes from the minds of the oppressed, and it's meant to sort of offer a critical reinterpretation of the social system. And so we can see that We Charge Genocide very much fits into this description of alternative epistemology, not least because it emanates from the worldview and knowledge of those victimized by racial capitalism, not least because they have perhaps the most intimate knowledge of what the United States actually is. Not only this, the petition calls upon the knowledge and perspective of those in the UN General Assembly who are committed to justice, to reject US rhetoric about racial progress, and instead to really come to terms with its criminal attack on Black people. And so a quote from the petition is, quote, any delegate who has visited the capital of the United States at Washington, D.C., governed directly by the central government without benefit of local authority, knows of his own knowledge that segregation and oppression in violation of the charter and the convention is a policy and creature of the government of the United States. And so here we can see that the petition is calling on the UN General Assembly to use its own knowledge and its own deep sort of understanding of oppression 
and subjection to reject U.S. hegemony, U.S. warmongering, U.S. exploitation, and to really commit itself to the justice that it purports to have. That was Dr. Sharice burden Stelly. Also present to commemorate the We Charge Genocide Petition of 1951 was Dr. Trevor Nguane, a lecturer at the Center for Sociological Research at the University of Johannesburg. Dr. Nguane is co-author of the book, Urban Revolt, State Power, and the Rise of People's Movements in the Global South. He says Black South Africa is quite familiar with colonial perpetrators of genocide. We also, in our part of the world, we've had our share of massacres, genocide. The most recent was the Marikana massacre, which happened on 16 August 2012, where miners who were striking for a living wage were shot dead by police. But of course, there are many ways in which miners get killed. For example, in 1986, under apartheid, we had the Kinross mine disaster, where 177 miners died underground. Now, when the Marikana miners who were on strike were camping on a mountain, a trade union leader, Comrade Joseph Machunjwa, addressed the workers on that fateful day of the massacre. He went on his knees with the TV cameras on him and pleaded with the workers to leave the mountain. He said, the lives of black people are cheap. These police are going to kill you. Of course, the miners did not leave the mountain and the police moved in and shot dead 34 miners. It is true, racial capitalism is a murderous system. It is indeed, as Paul Robson and his comrades argued in their petition to the United Nations, it is guilty of genocide. During the anti-apartheid struggle, various appeals were made to the United Nations, and some of these appeals had some success. For example, when apartheid was declared a crime against humanity. So today, among other things, I want to focus on what I call the hope of collectivism, the hope that is generated by collective struggle. So for example, over here, thousands of uh, kilometers away, were inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement because we could see that collectivism, that determination to fight for a better deal, for a better society, inspired us all the way here in Africa. Hope of collectivism is about fighting shoulder to shoulder with your comrades, with our communities, behind a vision of alternatives, fighting for radical social change. <clears throat> Unfortunately, today, there are so many things that eat away at our hope. For example, the economic situation is very bad for the majority of people, especially for the working class and the poor. And now we have COVID-19, uh, which is causing devastation. An important context for this suffering is because the capitalist system is in a rolling crisis. The capitalist class, the capitalist governments, they do not have solutions to the crisis. They cannot have solutions because they are looking for solutions within the ambit of their system. So they only discuss and debate and agree and disagree about how to manage the system, how to manage the crisis. Also, unfortunately, there is no strong challenge to their rule, the rule of the capitalists, the rule of private property, the rule of exploitation, the dominance of exploitation. There is no strong working class movement that has the power to challenge the capitalist class, to challenge their system of exploitation. There is no counter hegemonic social force that has the authority to take power. And with the crisis of the capitalist system, there is a crisis of bourgeois democracy. That is why we see dictators and races being voted into power. And we see how the gains of the working class, especially 
those uh, workers gained after the Second World War are being rolled back. And those parts of the world where people are fighting for those gains, which they never enjoyed, giving them these gains is being resisted. Now, it is important to point out that the gains, the rights and freedoms and benefits of so-called bourgeois democracy that workers enjoy, especially in the more advanced capitalist societies, did not come to workers on a plate. Although bourgeois ideology will argue that the gains were because of bourgeois democracy. So at the center of bourgeois ideology is to deny the power and centrality of the working class as a social force. So workers are made invisible and their voices silenced because we know that those freedoms were gained through organized struggle by workers in America, in England, all over the, the world, post Second World War. Now, the problem we face is that many of us, even if we are involved in the struggle, fighting for racial justice, fighting for climate justice, sometimes we fall into this trap of bourgeois ideology. So we tend to see the invisibility of the power of the working class. We only hear the silence of the working class. Of course, there are many reasons, you know, organized labor is weak, trade union leaders have sold out, et cetera, et cetera. But we should never lose sight of who are the producers because nothing that is there in the world that we enjoy can exist without the producers, the workers. We saw this during COVID-19. While many people work from home, someone had to make sure that the lights were on, that there was enough energy to power the computers and our laptops. Jeff Bezos of Amazon made his millions delivering goods and services online, but it was real living workers, black and brown mostly, who had to drive around and deliver those goods. The frontline healthcare workers could not work from home. They had to be there physically tending to the needs of the sick. I think the crisis of COVID-19 was reminding us of the importance of the working people. I wanted to talk about the barricades of everyday life where everyone is fighting for survival. What I want to say is that the Marikana massacre teaches us something. It teaches us how it is so easy for the transfer of pain, despair, and hopelessness from generation to generation. And how hard it is to transfer the hope of collectivism, the hope of fighting for a different kind of society from generation to generation. So the youth, they only feel the pain which they never actually experienced, you know, but uh, they inherited from their parents, from their grandparents. But then when they fight, when they fight behind that hope of collectivism, you know, they believe that they are doing something new. Of course, they are facing unique circumstances, but there is something also they inherit from the past. So with Marikana Masaka, it was not just a moment. It was a time when ordinary workers, they mobilized in their thousands and they fought even against barriers put by their union leaders, barriers put by the government and its labor laws to demand a living wage. They said it is better to die than to continue to live like this. They did not feel lucky that they have a job. They experienced their jobs as another form of suffering and pain, not an escape from suffering and pain. So the workers took risk, and even when 34 of their comrades lay de dead, they continued uh, on strike for three more weeks. So they were fighting for a decent, comfortable, safe life. Theirs was a revolutionary vision. So what I want to say is that I have no doubt that the crisis of capitalism, you know, it will mean that things will get worse for the majority of the people until the only thing to do is to erupt. And it is also clear to me that 
racial capitalism will continue to destroy the environment unless we replace it with eco-socialism. I think the first step is to say no to racial capitalism in total. The step taken by Paul Robson and his comrades when they took their petition to the UN and declared the USA government genocidal, they were saying no to racial capitalism. And that act inspires us to move forward against the system of exploitation. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Trevor Nguane speaking at a commemoration of the 1951 We Charge Genocide Petition. 60 years ago, the legally elected Prime Minister of the newly independent Democratic Republic of the Congo was assassinated as a result of plots orchestrated by the United States and its European allies. The Friends of the Congo celebrate January 17th as Patrice Lumumba Day. To mark the occasion, activists and academics held an online seminar moderated by Dr. Samuel T. Livingston, Associate Professor and Director of the African American Studies Program at Morehouse College. Among the speakers, Ludo De Witt, a Belgian sociologist and historian and author of his book, The Assassination of Lumumba. George Zangola Talaja, a professor of African and Global Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and Ira Dworkin, Associate Professor of English at Texas A&M University. Dworkin is author of Congo Love Song, African American Culture and the Crisis of the Colonial State. He says Black Americans immediately recognized the assassination of Lumumba as a crime against all people of African descent. I think it's important is really acknowledging the central role played by Black women in organizing around the Congo. And so here, I mean, I think we can look to centrally the example in the work of the Cultural Association for Women of African Heritage as a really important organization in the United States that was involved in advocating on behalf of Lumumba. So even before news of Lumumba's assassination sort of circulated widely, they were petitioning. I mean, this is led by the singer Abby Lincoln, actually organized a petition to have Lumumba released. And she sent this to Jalo Telly, who was the, um, at that time, was um, Sekou Torre's representative of the United Nations from Guinea Conakry, later head of the OAU and had a close relationship with Malcolm X, um, you know, a few years later. Um, so these are folks who are organizing in the U.S. Um, and a lot of that organizing as well, part of that story, maybe going back to the sort of idea of the importance of Pan-Africanism, the presence of a number of important African diplomats at the United Nations in the early years of independence are an important part of the story as well, uh, because it provides networks and connections. So the Cultural Association for Women of African Heritage is involved in this once the news breaks, which is it breaks on in New York on February 13th, 1961, that Lumumba um, and his comrades had been assassinated, that Maya Angelou, Abby Lincoln, and Rosa Gee give a speech in front of Louis Michaud's bookstore in Harlem, announcing that there will be a demonstration at the United Nations on February 15th. And that February 15th action is incredibly, incredibly important. It's an action that brings together African Americans and other diasporic Africans you know, in New York around the figure of Lumumba and his assassination. And there's a disruption that occurs when Adlai Stevenson is speaking from the gallery, when Adlai Stevenson is speaking to the United Nations, that is really transformative in many, many ways. And the people who were there in attendance, uh, I mentioned some of the organizers, but Amiri Baraka was there, Askia. Mohamed Touré was there, Aisha Rahman was there, Dan Watts of the Liberation Committee for Africa was there, Max Roach, Larry Neal, all of these figures who are really central to the emergence of the Black Arts Movement, which we can kind of understand as the cultural wing of the Black Power Movement. And one of the things, and one of the legacies that, again, I really want to sort of highlight that sort of comes out of this, is that you have institutions that are born in this period, so 1960 to 1961, and these are sustaining institutions that we see develop and flourish in really, really important ways. 
happened throughout the 1960s. So one example would be the Liberation um, Committee on Africa, headed by Daniel Watts, which was established in June of 1960. And they published their first issue of the journal, The Liberator, in March 1961. The first issue is all about Lumumba. And Christopher Tinson's book, Radical Intellect, um, is something um, to get more of a history of that organization journal that I encourage folks to, to look at. Um, Baraka's organization, On Guard, On Guard for Freedom, which has its first issue, which is also focused on Lumumba, comes out around that time as well. Freedom Ways publishes its first issue in the spring of 1961, and they reprint Nkrumah's UN speech about Lumumba in its issue as well. And these are institutions and organizations that are really sustaining and critical tools um, over a number of, you know, really for a number of years. Um, just a couple of other points to wrap up this history that I think are maybe relevant. One is that after that February 15th action, Maya Angelou and Rosa Gee go to meet Malcolm X um, and have a discussion with Malcolm X, and he's you know, somewhat critical about some of the tactics. This is in 1961. But Malcolm's own politics, he was very interested in Lumumba, we know, um, going back to the previous year when he met with um, Castro. But this is one important connection. And the other one that I should point out as well is that one of the things that we see, and this is why those publications and organizations are so important, is that Ralph Bunch, um, who was the head of the UN sort of Congo mission um, at that point, spoke harshly and critically about the protesters at the UN in, on February 15th. And he was supported in this, I should say, by Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, Lester Granger of the Urban League, NAACP's crisis sort of talked about it as a violent, you know, talked about the violence of the demonstration. And what we saw then is the need for other forms of organizing that weren't necessarily being addressed at that moment. And we can talk about maybe what happens a little bit later, but by some of the sort of mainstream and legacy sort of civil rights organizations around this issue, right? Um, and so that's one of the moments when we see those organizations and the kind of print culture, right? The newspapers and publishing houses and things that emerge out of that moment. And Lumumba, again, the sort of legacy of Lumumba is really central. And it's you know, something that I do want us to think about in terms of these kinds of institutions and organizations and figures who are so central. I mean, I could sort of, there's a half dozen other kind of organizations, figures, um, individuals who are really kind of galvanized at that moment. And that galvanization, I mean, I think the other thing I want to say is while they're galvanized by that moment, these are also folks who had been organizing before that, right? Um, so there's something really kind of transformative about that, but it's also building on um, you know, established sort of political networks and cultures and infrastructure that a lot of those folks have been involved in previously. Thank you. Dr. Nzongola? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, a question for Ira. Uh, I didn't come to the U.S. until 1962, but I heard that uh, the heroine, the leader of that the storming of the U.N. Assembly in February 61 was uh, Air Fakit. You didn't mention her. So there's a number of people, there's a number of folks who we know were there, some folks who may have been there. A lot of the original reports suggested Malcolm. Right there. Um, I've heard reports that Eartha Kitt was there, but she's not someone who I've confirmed was there. She was certainly someone right. who combined with Malcolm um, and sort of spoke of, and did speak about the Congo certainly around 64. Uh. Um, May Mallory, um, a close associate of Robert Williams, was another really important figure who was there, who was in, uh, accused of doing that. But yeah, but there were a number of folks who were there. I mean, the other thing that I think maybe should mention as well, um, so after you know, Ralph Bunch sort of really um, dismissed, you know, and then I should say the dismissal was not only about the tactics, the dismissal was also that these African Americans were naive, um, <laughs> were naive in, um, you know, their investment in a charlatan such mm. as Lumumba. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so some of it was generational, not all of it was. Um, you mentioned, and yours mentioned, the sort of 1958 Ghana conference. That's where Du Bois, you know, an elder at that point, obviously 90 years old, met mm. Lumumba, and by the fall of 1960, when Lumumba's under house arrest, Du Bois speaks in favor of Lumumba and says, I didn't really kind of understand what he was doing when I first met him, mm. in but I get it now. But that's kind of dismissal, and so we see these figures. Oh, and so the thing I was going to add is after Bunch comes out and says that, the most two most prominent African-American writers at that point would have been James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry. Right. Mm -hmm. Both of them came out very publicly, so in oh, March yeah. of 61, sort of saying that they support the demonstration, they regret that they were unable to attend. But really, you know, so it becomes a point of attention, right? And, you know, we have those, you know, artists who are sort of thinking about them as well. And I guess the, the final question has to do with 
how do you repair the damage done by assassinating national leaders? What does that look like to actually re to make reparations for the assassination of a Martin Luther King, a Patrice Lumumba, a Maurice Mpolo, a Joseph Okito, Malcolm X, Megar Evers, who's born on the exact same day as Lumumba? How do we begin to do that? And I, I want us to think not just in terms of the appeal, but in terms of how do African people and the uh, allies of African people who are interested in telling the truth and social justice, how do you repair that damage? How do you think through that? Uh, Dr. Nzungola, if you could wrap up for us. In that blog I published in uh, the Review of African Political Economy two days ago, I have the answer of Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon, in his book, uh, Toward the African Revolution, has a chapter called um, about uh, Lumumba's death. Would you have done otherwise? He points out two major mistakes uh, done in the case of the, the Congo. One was Lumumba's appeal to the United Nations to intervene. Now, as you know, as some of you know, Lumumba and Kasavubu went first to the U.S. Embassy, <laughs> naively speaking, asking the U.S. Ambassador to have the United States intervene to kick out the Belgian troops who had uh, invaded the Congo on uh, July 10th, 1960. Ambassador Timberlake, the U.S. Ambassador, told him, no, you should uh, call upon the United Nations. The United States can't intervene against a fellow NATO member. And so they dutifully called upon the United Nations and not knowing or understanding that the United Nations Secretary General, Doug Hammarskjöld, had the same worldview as the United States government. Uh, for him, he saw the struggle in the Congo as a struggle for the West to keep control of Central Africa uh, and was going to do everything to make sure that Lumumba does not succeed. Uh, and yet, we saw the Lumumba called and upon the UN to come, thinking the UN is going to help him when the UN came to weaken him and eventually to participate, to collaborate in his demise. The second point uh, Fanon makes is the, the mistake made by African states by sending their troops under United Nations supervision. We saw that in the case of Ghana. Ghana was the first country to send troops on the UN. As a matter of fact, ironically, they were flown into the Congo in Soviet planes. <laughs> the Soviet planes brought the Ghanaian contingent in the Congo. But that Ghanaian cont contingent was under the control of British officers because Nkrumah, for whatever reasons, had maintained the British officers in high in command, the, uh, General Alexander, who was head of the Ghanaian army, was British. All of the colonels and majors were British, and the, the Ghanaians came way, way be below. And so General Alexander was known to be one of the most anti-Lumumba officers in the UN force, and yet he was there. The same was for the, the Moroccan general, who was a CIA guy, who actually helped Mobutu stage the coup of September 14. I made a statement to the Moroccans in, in uh, Rabat in 2011. They were all shocked. And somebody said, yeah, is that true? I said, oh, yeah, I have the evidence. And we're seeing that today. In 2013, the SADEC, the, the Southern African Development uh, uh, Community, decided to send troops in the Congo to end this murderous killing of of innocent civilians by uh, uh, military units that have been in the Congo from Uganda, from Rwanda, and Congolese who have been involved in uh, uh, this looting of minerals and so on, who have been killing people. So they decided that to put up troops from uh, three countries, South Africa, Malawi, and Tanzania. United Nations insisted that this force brigade must be placed under the United Nations mission of Congo, MONISCO. And for some reason, I don't understand, African countries agreed. Now, you know what has happened? The Force Brigade hasn't done a thing once they got rid of one militia group. That group is the only group that the Force Brigade was able to get rid of. 
all the others are still there and nothing has been done because the United Nations has no interest in ending the strife in Eastern Congo because the corporate giants of this world want to continue looting our resources and we don't want a peace in the Congo. So these are two mistakes. So what is the lesson? The lesson is that we have to rely on our own forces. That is the main lesson. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Nzongo. I appreciate that. Dr. Debute, you want to add? Yeah, I just want to add something on what Professor Gonzalo has said. I don't think that uh, Lumumba had any illusion into the United Nations. What he was thinking was that the so-called Afro-Asian bloc, the people recently independent, would heavy pressure and would use their force and would use their troops within the United Nations contingent just to come to the aid of the uh, democratically elected Congolese government. Okay. And as you said, this is the tragedy of the Congo crisis mm -hmm. that when Lumumba fled to the east to try to reach his supporters after right. he was deposed as a prime minister, mm -hmm. he fell into the hands of uh, Mobutu thanks to Ghanian blue helmets. I, I published mm -hmm. the documents in my book in which the Swedish commander-in-chief von Horn who ordered the Ghanian officer, which was a British officer, uh -huh. uh, saying, you may not protect Lumumba when, exactly. because, because we know he's, he's, he's running around somewhere and he's been chased by the troops of Mobutu. And at a certain moment, Lumumba arrived at the Ghanian army barracks. He asked protections. The soldiers wanted to protect him. And the officer yeah. said, no, you have to release him. Exactly. And that's when he fell into the hands of uh, Mobutu. So I think this is, is, is a very important lesson. Part of the, of, the, of the lesson of the Congo crisis is that for the first time, you had an international engagement of the South and mm -hmm. you had a treason, or at least uh, an exception of the domination of the West by exactly. a lot of African newly independent countries. Dr. Dworkin, how do you repair that damage from the perspective of somebody who's doing the research on connections with the diaspora? It's such an important uh, question and a difficult one. I think maybe one sort of just um, sort of footnote I would add to this really important conversation about the United Nations that I think is worth thinking about as well is that so when uh, Patrice Lumumba in his efforts to appeal to the United Nations makes his one trip to, United, to the United States and then arrives in New York, so this is at the end of July, um, part of that visit while he's in the U.S. also includes reaching out to African-American sort of organizations. So he speaks famously at Howard University during that time as well in Washington, D.C. So it is clear, I think, I think maybe this goes to, um, I think, Professor DeVitte's point that Lumumba was not under particular romantic illusions about the United Nations, is that I think certainly from what we can take away from that visit is an understanding of the way that he sort of understood the necessity of those appeals and kind of outreach and organizing taking place on multiple levels at the same time. You know, the other thing I might point out in this context, um, tomorrow is the National uh, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And so I had mentioned um, the reaction of some of the mainstream civil rights organizations to the protest at the UN in 1961. The other thing I think I should mention as well, or might mention in this context, is that by November of 1964, on the eve of the actions that took place in Kisangani, a group of the mainstream civil rights organizations actually wrote to President Johnson asking that the U.S. government withdraw all support for Moise Chambe. This is actually within 24 hours of the sort of U.S.-backed intervention there. And this really marks a significant shift that takes place. So we're talking about, you know, three and a half years later, it's the same organizations. Roy Wilkins, who had signed one of the earlier, is one of the signatories, and along with Martin Luther King, who, you know, certainly represents a different trajectory within that sort of group of six. And, and I should say as well, and so this is actually, so this is the end of November of 1964. This is actually a couple weeks before King receives the Nobel Peace Prize. So two weeks later, he's in Sweden, and he's actually talking about the Congo there. He calls it a violent harvest. So he understands, certainly King understands it, as a cumulative event in that way. And it's a cumulative event that's ramifications would be 
ongoing in that particular way. So my way of kind of answering or sort of providing one kind of answer to that question is the idea that I do think the kind of sustained organizing and political pressure that younger generations of activists were putting on mainstream organizations during that did create a shift, I think, in the position and the kinds of work that was taking place. You've been listening to the Black Agenda Report on the Progressive Radio Network. Information for liberation. Thank you.